I'm just going to uh, reflect on uh, some of the uh, reporting and broader discussion on uh, adverse events, uh, particularly relating to clotting events uh, after AstraZeneca vaccine. And I'd strongly caution the public and the media in reaching any conclusion on the two fatality cases that have been mentioned in the media. Uh, we have uh, 11,000 adverse event reports in front of us. Now, that sounds like a massive number, but they range, of course, from a sore arm through to people having a heart attack a week after having a vaccine, uh, through to clotting events and a number of other things. Now, for the serious events, we certainly look at every case in detail. We discuss them with global counterparts. And we also look to see, most importantly, whether there's any evidence of cause and effect. And of course, the current evidence on those two cases, although those cases are still under investigation, and for privacy reasons, I don't want to go into details of individual patient tests and results and other conditions they may or may not have had. <coughs> but the current evidence doesn't suggest a likely association. We do have to remember, <coughs> pardon me, but sadly, every week in Australia, 3,000 people die of all sorts of causes. Now, in the weeks before they die, particularly if they're older people or if they're hospitalised, they may have had a number of medical interventions of all different types. That may or may not include COVID vaccination. And of course, in our community, again, often the most tragic cases are those of sudden death, where people have done all the different normal activities of daily living. That may or may not, again, have included a vaccination, but it could have included a lot of things. We also have to remember that uh, in reporting cases of people presenting at hospitals with, with clots or to their GP, 50 Australians a day uh, report to hospitals or their doctors with serious blood clots from a range of activities or coming for no reason at all. And almost all of them have no relationship to vaccination, 50 cases a day. And while attribution is hard because sometimes a blood clot can kill you within minutes, other times it may kill you weeks later if it's a very serious and potentially fatal one, we think about a third of those 50, so that's still 16 or 17, we think about a third of those 50 do lead to death. And so that's a rather sobering statistic. It's not quite one per hour of fatal blood clots in Australia. It's one of the more significant causes of, of death in this country. It's also important to uh, realise that uh, we are not seeing a flood of these serious cases. Each case is rare, looked in at detail, and there's debate about whether the frequency is one in 100,000, one in 200,000, depending on the group. Uh, but th throughout the world, we are seeing a small number of cases each week uh, associated with, with the vaccines. But it's also important, and I was speaking with them as recently as 11 p.m. last night, that the US FDA, the US Centre of Disease, for Disease Control and the European Medicines Agency have all, in the last few days, confirmed with either or both the AstraZeneca and Janssen vaccine, which are very similar in nature, that the benefits dramatically exceed the risks. So knowing that there's a small background risk of rare blood clots is something to not hide, but all medicines, all treatments, all medical procedures, all activities of daily living, driving a car, flying in an aeroplane, have some risk. And in the case of these vaccines, the benefits exceed the risk. So we are looking at uh, every case that's reported to us. We are looking at these two cases that have been in the media today and some others that have been reported in great detail. Now, I know that the question is often asked, well, when are you going to tell us what the answer is? Sometimes the testing is quite clear, whether it's a definite association or whether it's definitely not associated. And we can reach a conclusion within hours and report that. Other times we realise that uh, we have to wait for particular tests to be done. And some of these tests are only done in one hospital in all of Australia, and there's a line-up for those tests. Or if someone sadly dies, it may be too late to get some of the normal tests that you'd do on a living human being in a hospital. And so every case is different. And so sometimes it does take several days. And even then, it might require a post-mortem, if, if it has been a case, to 
definitively conclude or exclude an event. So, but our commitment is that as soon as we have the data, as soon as we have the test results from the hospital systems, we make a determination. If it's one that requires medical specialists outside our organisation, although we're fortunate to have some of Australia's best doctors in the civil service, we get their advice and we will make a decision and announce that decision. So, uh, so that's essentially uh, where, where we stand with the uh, assessment and reporting of, of clotting cases. I think that why it's important to emphasise that sadly 3,000 people die every week, sadly 50 people get serious clotting disorders every day and perhaps a third of them die either immediately or soon after, is to put this in perspective in the terms of a shared responsibility we all have. We have a shared responsibility, whether we're government, whether we're civil servants, whether we're the community or whether we're the media, for providing accurate, unbiased information on benefits and also on risks. We, we shouldn't sweep risks under the carpet. But the benefits, as I've said before, especially in the over 50 group, who, if they do contract COVID, become seriously ill or die, with the percentage of those increasing in every decade of age, it means that the benefits significantly outweigh the risk.